So today we're going to dive into the weird and wild world of 70s North Carolina exploitation film. A lot of films being made in North Carolina in the early to mid 70s. Uh, there was Axe, there was Preacher Man, and there was the works of this weird and wild filmmaker, Pat Patterson, uh, most well known for uh, Dr. Gore, aka The Body Shop, but he also made this an incredible, incredible movie, The Electric Chair, which is now available on Blu-ray from Code Red. Who was Pat Patterson, or J.G. Patterson, as he's known in the credits of uh, The Electric Chair? I think his name was Julius something Patterson, but everybody knew him as, as Pat Patterson. Uh, he was quite a character. I, I think he was a true eccentric I, from from what people talk about him, uh, and I mean that in the best possible way, he sounds like a really great person. And even now, I mean, he died very young. He died when he was like 45. And he looks a lot older than, than I think he, he really was. He died in like 1974. He died before the electric chair was actually finished, and his editor and assistant director finished the movie. Uh, you know, after he, he died, apparently he was ill when he was making the electric chair. But Patterson was an interesting character. He was, um, he'd done a lot of live magic and, um, and then he got involved, I think in the sixties and the early seventies with Herschel Gordon Lewis doing special effects on some of the later Herschel Gordon Lewis film doing the gore effects. And, uh, in the early seventies, he got involved in North Carolina filmmaking, um, apparently North Car I mean, North Carolina has such a, a rich history in 70s exploitation films. Uh, apparently there was uh, an early film, Preacher Man, which was shot in North Carolina like in the early, like in 1970. And that kicked off like this whole group of filmmakers in the area making these little like drive-in movies. In the early 70s, I mean, there were only like three networks. I mean, there was it was not a lot of stuff going on. It was the drive-ins. Apparently, like in like the in the Raleigh Charlotte area, there were like half a dozen drive-ins. They would just play these movies, Dust to Dawn type of type of things. You know, I mean, Dust to Dawn drive-ins. I mean, the, the, the only the closest thing that we have that, to it these days is like a Joe Bob Briggs marathon on Shutter, but. Back in the day, I mean, that was a real thing, you know, and they would play these crazy movies like, I mean, Blood Feast and 2000 Maniacs and these little, these little exploitation movies. They would just play, and it was just amazing. You could make these movies and kind of tour around with them. And that was what Patterson was really excited about. Patterson was not, according to people who, who knew him, and people still speak highly of him, like he's died, you know, over 40 years ago and people still remember him and they still talk about him. I think that shows you how interesting a character he was and fascinating a person that he, he was. They talk about how he uh, he really did not l even like films. <laughs> he was like, he was like one of these guys like uh, Jerry Warren who were just like, you know, he, ju he, was, ex he was excited by exploitation, you know, these people, what exploitation films. What that what 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 that means is he was excited by these guys, these little filmmakers like Kroger Bab, and these little. There, there was this whole world of of exploitation film, and what that means is people who were like independent filmmakers throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, where these were not major studios. These were little people uh, who had these made these little movies, and they would tour around the country with these little movies, like almost like a carnival, like a circus. Like the circus comes to town, like uh, a Kroger Bab movie would, would come to town. And you'd have, um, they'd, they'd set up in churches or little you know, meeting places, and they'd sell tickets to these shows, and they'd sell little pamphlets and and stuff, uh, hygiene films, films about uh, babies being born and stuff. It was just a way to, it was a way to kind of socially acceptably show sex and violence within veiled as a, an educational film. And so these people, these guys would go around throughout the country and it started to develop in the in the 50s and the 60s with like, you know, what we now know as exploitation movies where they were getting more bold and they were showing sex and they were showing more violence and more sex. And and that evolves into the Herschel Gordon Lewis's and the Dave Friedman's and the Doris Wishman's and the Something Weird video, the stuff you'd, you'd have in Something Weird video. 
video that goes in the 60s and the early 70s. And there are a lot of people in North Carolina who are doing this type of, doing, doing this type of thing. You know, William William Girdler, uh, you know, and and uh, you know all of these all of these filmmakers. And uh, Patterson was like he, he told people that you know he he made he wanted to be a millionaire. That's what he said. He's like, I want to be a millionaire. And I don't think Patterson was really. Uh, into uh, the college boys, because I mean, you know, there was this area in, in in North Carolina. There was a lot of people who were kind of graduating from from universities and from colleges in the area. People like Frederick Fidel, who went on to make Axe, which Patterson produced, and then he made another film, A Date with a Kidnapper, Kidnap Coed, and you know. Uh, Frederick Fidel was a guy who idolized like Orson Welles and, and there were other people coming out of the scene who were working with Patterson and Patterson was working with, with them like Worth Keeter uh, who, who went on to make a lot of direct-to-video movies and then work on the Power Rangers and, and so I don't think Patterson was into these college boys you know he was like he's, he, he's, he told people I make movies for the working class you know I make it for the blue collar workers who go to the drive in and buy their ticket and that's the type of film that he made he made a movie The Body Shop Dr. Gore you know and, and, um, and uh, which is a wild wild movie and then he started working on this thing, The Electric Chair, which is, uh, it was an obscure movie. The Electric Chair for years and years and years uh, was, I think, difficult to find. I don't even know if it was ever released on VHS. Something Weird Video may have released it on VHS. Because, I mean, Something Weird Video, of course, the, the legendary video label, which was a champion of the, the grindhouse, the, the exploitation, the drive-in type of movie, got, you know, made deals with Doris Wishman and Dave Friedman, started releasing their movies, and uh, released Axe on a DVD release. And I think they may have released The Electric Chair in VHS, but Axe, the, the first DVD release, I think that was when the the... That was the first version of uh, the electric chair. It was a version that was cut down. Uh, Seventeen minutes of the the film were were cut, and the guy who cut the the um, the seventeen minutes out, there's an interview with him on the uh, the electric chair Blu-ray, which is now out on Code Red. And the Code Red is uh, the Code Red Blu-ray is apparently is the full uncut version. It's from a, a negative, and it, it, it well, I don't, I don't know if it's from, I don't, I don't remember if if Code Red said they they had the original name, but it looks like it's from a negative. It looks beautiful. It really does look beautiful as the film. It, it's a, it's a weird movie. We got to talk about it, but uh, it does look. It, it is a beautiful release, and the soundtrack is relatively, you know, spotless and uh, you know as much as it can. But he talked. The, there's an interview with the guy who edited uh, the the movie, and he talks about how um, he didn't edit it for content, he just edited it to be able to fit on fewer reels. Because that's how, because he tells the story of like, that's why movies were edited a lot. They would edit for television to, to just be able to fit in a time slot, and they were edited... It, you know, back in the days when you were you had film cans, uh, you were shipping film cans around the country. You know, if you had a, a difference between three film can, three, uh, you know, uh, three reels and then four reels, if you could cut enough to get the film just into three reels, you you know you could save money with shipping. So that's the reason why a lot of these grindhouse films were were chopped up or edited a lot of it wasn't for you know content or you know, nobody these theaters cared what the stupid crazy stuff you showed it was just to save money uh, but and apparently the, I, i'd like to watch the shorter version of the electric chair because apparently it just doesn't it's not even any less crazier than this movie uh, but so that's a, a big preamble to kind of tell you about the early years of, uh, you know, the Raleigh, North Carolina, the Raleigh, Charlotte, North Carolina era. Ex and, and they moved and it went on, you know, North Carolina is still, you know, I mean, in Wilmington, North Carolina became De Laurentiis Studios and they shot Blue Velvet there and, um, cat's eye and the whole North Carolina area seems like a cool area. I, I'd almost like to, to visit it. You know, I, I, I've seen so much of these, uh, exploitation films and, and, um, I, I, uh, I videotaped a Q and a with, with, uh, Frederick Fidel when he showed acts and date with a kidnapper here in, in Austin, uh, a couple of years ago, it's on my, my channel. 
and um, it's a yeah. And he tell he tells a lot of stories about the, the North Carolina era filmmaking there. And I, I'd love to go and visit the locations where they they shot these movies. Though I'm sure you know it's you know again 40 years on now, a lot of them are, are gone. They don't exist. But the electric chair is it's a crazy movie. I mean the the first few minutes in the movie, um, which uh, you know play over the credit sequence. I mean. The, the whiny, weird electronic score with the characters in the dark. I mean, if you're a fan of, like, the psychotronic movies or, or of, of recent years, the films which, you know, Bleeding Skull, you know, uh, you know releases, that type of stuff, if you're a fan of, of that type of stuff, uh, you will be, it's like, you will immediately be captured by this, the, opening, the opening minutes of this film are just so, like... Uh, <laughs> you're, you're just like, I can't, I can't, I can't rip myself away from this movie. What, what follows after those few weird, wild, screwed up minutes are, um, a, a lot of boring, a lot of monotony. It's, it's a story of a uh, small town, Bible thumping community, cheating husbands and wives, uh, perdition, uh, people being, uh, you know, uh, 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 falsely accused or accused and electric chairs and, 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 you know, crime and punishment. And in this, and also this long, you know, Southern courtroom drama, this type of a thing, that type of stuff, you know, the stuff you might see in a, you know, in a Russ Meyer movie, like those early black and white Russ Meyer movies about, uh, judgment and perdition and people, you know, paying for their cheating, uh, being a cheating husband or cheating wife and all this stuff. But I mean, the thing is with, with Russ Meyer is that he was an actual film, he was an accomplished filmmaker, you know, and, uh, this, this movie is a weird movie. I mean, there, I mean, the, the way things are shot, the way things are cut, scenes where care plays from the, the, back of the head, you, a character will be talking, but you'll see like the back of his head for way too long or uh, just stuff that doesn't quite add up. Weird, weird shots, weird things, uh, a lot of out of focus shots. There's a, there'll be like a medium shot where the, the, the lead actor is just completely like, the wall behind him is completely in focus, but he's out of focus. They had a lot of focus problems with the camera on this movie. Apparently the first cameraman was fired because of the movie, which was really not the camera's fault. Apparently it was just the uh, malfunctioning equipment. Uh, was the was the main problem also it's a weird movie because it's like this courtroom drama and there's supposed to be a, a couple of different trials portrayed in the film and there's a couple of different scenes of um, uh, an execution and they apparently that's one of the gimmicks of the film is they shot with like a real electric chair which was used for real electrocutions and it's really realistic like how they strap them them down and and, and, and everything supposedly is supposed to be re realistic. Um, but I, I, I guess it is. I mean, I, they, they do this weird thing where they put the stuff, the thing over somebody's head. And I don't know if it was, I don't know. I, apparently it was a real electric chair. I, I don't know, if, you know <laughs> what the hell that was, but the, what I was getting at is that there are a couple different execution scenes and a couple different trials are supposed to take place at different times. But they did not even make the effort to like move people around in like the you'll see shots of like the audience, uh, you know, uh, in in the in the um, in the courtroom. And everybody's in like the same place as in in both trials. So it's like everybody literally like, you know, sat in the exact same place as they did. It. Well, obviously they shot all the courtroom scenes together and the execution scenes together, but they didn't even make the, the effort to try to make them look different. But it, it, it has this weird kind of repetition, sense of repetition that kind of um, appeals to, to my brain, you know, because there are, you know, that's the thing with exploitation films. Uh, you see a lot of them, uh, one of the things that a lot of exploitation films have in common is above the gore and the cheapness and the lighting and the this and the that, they have this sense of repetition. There's this weird sense of repetition that psychotronic films have where they'll repeat a lot of 
shots and things throughout the film there it's this almost this weird kind of sensibility and the electric chair has that uh, a lot of the scenes are boring. I guess you could. A lot of people could be bored by it, you know. And you're like amazed, like what, what is this? I mean, there's a little bit of nudity, but you could cut it out and be kind of G-rated. Um, there, I mean, the the electric chair scenes are the gimmick. They're the real exploitation gimmick. Watch the real electric chair, you know. And that's the gimmick that would get people in. And the poster art has an electric chair on it. And them holding the name of the movie, the electric chair. You want to see the electric chair. Everything is that's before the electric chair is just a way to get you to the electric chair of this movie obviously obviously that's the gimmick that's the exploitation gimmick in this film electric chair that's it is <laughs> you know everything else the southern courtroom drama bible thumping community all this stuff you know russ meyer was a great filmmaker but did he have an electric chair no did pat patterson have an electric chair yes um but uh it's 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 an it's an interesting movie to 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 watch and it has really great actors um the 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 two main leads at the beginning of the film uh i think one was she was katie cortez and the other guy uh the other guy looks like dean stockwell by the way and <laughs> he looks like dean stockwell and then there's this one guy who's supposed to be like this crazy brother and he looks a lot like weird paul he looks a lot like this uh this uh, this guy Weird Paul he reminds me of of, of Weird Paul, and um, and he and it's just, it's it's a weird movie it's it's just if you love like the something weird uh, like like uh, imagine like a Herschel Gordon Lewis movie but like without the gore and he does it as a courtroom drama it's like a southern courtroom drama you know <laughs> imagine like an exploitation movie without the exploitation at all. And you have that, but with some good actors, some good, I mean, there was so many, it seemed like there was so many interesting, good actors in the North Carolina community, because I mean, that's another thing with Frederick Fidel with Axe and, uh, and uh, date with a kidnapper, uh, such good actors, such good acting, uh, it, throughout, throughout the film, uh, throughout the, those films. And in, in this film, even with Patterson's, uh, you know, whatever incompetencies or, or or whatever, the the actors on display are acting their hearts out, acting their hearts out, and I mean the opening scenes of the film. I mean after you get through that, op as as I said, the crazy opening, the opening scenes with that woman in her, uh, you know, kind of decrepit house, very, you know, very blue collar, struck a very deep chord. A very interesting things, but I mean, a lot of boredom in the film. It's not, it's not blood feast. It's not ripping out tongues. And everything. Though they they do mention that the her tongue was ripped out, in in the film. And I always wondered, is that a reference to blood feast? Who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? So, an interesting movie. The the Blu-ray, as I said, picture quality is great. There's an interview with the guy who cut the film down, and he's talking about his his life uh, and his uh, experiences in exploitation, uh, or in the Raleigh uh, or in the North Carolina film film community. And uh, there's an interview. There's a rather there's not an interview, but there's a commentary track throughout the entire film with Worth Keeter and another guy who were production assistants who who worked with Patterson on the film. They have a lot of stories. To, I'm honestly I'm only about 30 minutes into their commentary track, but it was so exciting. Uh, I mean, I got I, I watched this movie last night. I was just so energized by it. I'm like, I got to I got to do a video on it. It's so great. They have a lot of stories about Patterson about how he was like a chain smoker and he would just, you know, have these pools of buckets of water they would dump all the cigarettes into. It smelled and he was I mean, the stories of that they tell with Patterson are very interesting. He's such a, he must have had quite a personality to have made that deep impression on people with his relatively brief time in the industry and the fact that he died decades and decades ago. His movies live on, you know, the Dr. Gore VHS is out there. Uh, the, uh, the Dr. Gore uh, DVD is out of print. Uh, but I want to get it now. I want to get it. And, uh, and, um, the electric chair now is a, a bright blue, uh, Blu-ray is, is out there. Hopefully Dr. Gore can be released on Blu-ray at some point. Who knows? Maybe, maybe, um, 
maybe uh, 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 you know Bleeding Skull video can 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 do a restoration of it. Maybe Agfa can do a restoration of that uh, here 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 in Austin and, and get that going. Get the you know bring out Worth Keeter and have him talk about. Uh, because, I mean, you could talk about William Girdler, you can talk about... Because, I mean, I think William Girdler did uh, the music on Dr. Gore. Uh, the, the the guy who was, again, another another Kentucky-based filmmaker who kind of made a few movies and then uh, died, in a, died in a crash. Uh, incredible filmmaker of the Manitou and Three on Me Hook and the Zebra Killer and, you know, uh, and all those uh, the movies. Uh, but, oh, man. If you love exploitation movie, if you love something weird, if you love weird stuff, you go there for the weird. You don't go there to be like, oh, you know, thrill me a minute. You go, you're in for the weird experience. And this movie is weird. You'll see 70s fashion, ugly 70s fashion, ugliness, uh, you know, uh, the way people looked back in the day in a beautiful Blu-ray transfer. Everything looks sharp and crystal clear. The out-of-focus stuff is out-of-focus wonderfully <laughs> and uh just a great a great a, a, a great little discovery i think you know a great discovery on behalf of the motion picture industry welcome to the world of home video entertainment and larry drake larry drake shows up and larry drake the uh the actor of la law and dark man and you, you know larry drake he shows up in the courtroom scenes you know he did a lot of little little movies and uh he's uh it's the weirdest thing in the world where he's just and it's actually distracting because he's in this courtroom scene and he's like three foot taller than everybody else i mean you can't i mean even a young larry drake is very he's very recognizable he has quite a physical presence you know so that was that was wild. That was weird. You watch this movie. Oh, <laughs> it was weird, wild. Uh, another strange element in this movie. <laughs> 